Thank you for joining me. This is Eye on Business and I'm Ben Kritz. Today we'll be discussing prospects for Philippine agriculture. In particular, a proposal to improve agriculture's access to bank credit. So let's get right to it. Agriculture has in many ways been the Philippines' economic Achilles heel. Although it accounts for about a third of the country's workforce, it accounts for less than 10% of GDP. It hardly seems a week goes by that there is not some agricultural crisis. So far this year, the country's faced an upheaval over rice importation, uh, shortages of certain staple foods such as galonggong, the popular fish, uh, a widespread outbreak of the African swine flu virus, and conflict between government and farmers over the liberalization of sugar imports. And, of course, there is the usual run of weather-related disasters and the crop damage and destruction that comes with that, which we are unfortunately uh, just cleaning up from another round of just today uh, with the passage of Typhoon Ursula. There is not one comprehensive reason for the sorry state of Philippine agriculture, so of course there is not just one solution. However, one area that can be improved is agriculture's access to credit. And in, to try to help that situation, in 2009, the government enacted the, what is called the Agri-Agra Law, uh, a, a law designed to help farmers, fishermen, and agrarian reform beneficiaries access bank credit. Uh, Republic Act 10,000, which was known as the Agri-Agra Re Reform Credit Act of 2009, mandated banks to allot at least 15% of their loanable funds to farmers and fishermen and 10% to agrarian reform beneficiaries. It was a good idea, but in practice has not worked at all. Uh, according to data from the BSP, since the law was enacted, the banks uh, uh, as, a, as a group uh, not once have met the total 25% threshold. Through the end of September of last year, for instance, banks were only lending an average of about 9.6% of their loanable funds to farmers and less than 1% to agrarian reform beneficiaries, which of course are under both thresholds by a great deal. Evidently, the banking sector finds it less expensive to pay the penalty for not meeting the mandate than to extend credit to a high-risk sector like agriculture. Well, a new bill in the House of Representatives is seeking to correct what uh, turns out to have been serious shortcomings in the agri-agri law and make it do what it was originally intended. Joining me today to discuss this measure and the prospects for Philippine agriculture in general is one of this country's foremost experts on this subject, Bruce Tolentino. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a former undersecretary for policy and planning for the Department of Agriculture and currently a, a member of the Monetary Board. Welcome. Um, House Bill 5681, which, yes. correct me if I'm wrong, is currently undergoing committee hearings. Mm -hmm. Uh, would amend the 2009 Agri-Agra law. Uh, can you explain what changes it would make to the existing law? Yeah. The new bill has been filed by Congressman Junikua of Curino. He is the chair of the House Committee on Banks. A companion bill will also be filed in the Senate by uh, Senator Grace Poe. Okay. as soon as the initial discussions in the House take place. I see. Now, this new bill that has been filed by Senator, uh, by Congressman Kua is an effort to ensure that the funds that are meant for agriculture really get to agriculture. Mm -hmm. And doing that means ensuring that the ways by which the banks are approaching agriculture can be more varied than what was designed in the past. Well, we're doing this the third time around. Prior to uh, Republic Act 10,000, there was Presidential Decree 717. That's right. Which was the original mm -hmm. uh, bill uh, mandating a quota on loans for agriculture. That failed. That's why 10,000 was created. And now an effort to try to make it work is again taking place. 
Congressman Kua has taken the effort to make this a multi-sectoral effort. He has called in the BSP, he has called in the various bankers associations, he has asked uh, input from Land Bank and DBP, and the result is a bill that I believe has some elements that will make it work much better this time around. Uh, first, what Congressman Kua proposes is to unify the definition and the beneficiaries between agricultural farmers mm -hmm. and agrarian reform beneficiaries. The, there will not be a distinction made between these two groups. After all, what they do is agriculture. That's right, yes. Uh, that, that was one thing that, that always surprised me about the, the 2009 yes. law was that it had separated those. But um, Although they all do agriculture, agrarian reform beneficiaries are by definition farmers for yes. the most part. Yes. Um, the, 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 the credit needs seem to be very different Yes. Um, at least at the outset. Yeah. Um, so is it, does that, uh, will the agrarian reform beneficiaries maybe get shortchanged if they are lumped in together? Um, or do you think that'll, that, that will still, that will help them Actually, as well? Actually, agrarian reform beneficiaries will gain much more from this uh, measure of unifying the categories. The reason why is that in the old law, the loans were limited to the agrarian reform beneficiary himself, not members of his household, not his descendants, because uh, it was defined in such a way that only the original agrarian reform beneficiary would receive the loan. What is being done in this new law is to focus not only on the farmer himself, but on his household because his household income is what matters for the, farmer, farmer, uh, for the farmer's welfare. What, his, what he earns from his farm, what his spouse earns from a side business, from his children also, that's what matters for the household. Uh -huh. And the idea is that in whatever ways the farm household earns income will be the ways by which the law and the loans will provide support for. So it's not only agricultural activities, it's also small and medium enterprises related to the farm household. It's also uh, the ancillary businesses that make a farm household's life better, like a Sari Sari store. Mm -hmm. And it also relates to all the activities that enable the farm household to rise up in income and in welfare. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's take a step back a little bit. Um, as you said, this uh, 5681 will be the third attempt yes. uh, to do something. Why, have, why, why did the Presidential Decree um, and Republic Act 10,000, why did those fail exactly? What went wrong? Um, um, because on paper, that, that looks like a good idea. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let me put on my uh, BSP hat okay. and economist's hat to begin with. When you force the banks to do anything, it's basically a tax. Mm -hmm. uh, their lifeblood is uh, lending. They want to lend, but very often they can't find the right projects to lend to. And by right projects, I mean credit-worthy projects that have... Uh, a fair chance of earning, that have a fair chance of making a good return, and be able to pay the loans on time and pay the pay the uh, amortizations on a regular basis. The problem here really is much larger. It's not a, the fault of the banks. It's really the government's strategy on agriculture all along over the last, say, 40 years or so. We've relied on uh, providing, uh, uh, pushing the banks, like forcing them to do this, instead of putting our efforts and our energies and our thinking and strategies on how is it that we make agricultural projects profitable? How can we make the agricultural sector itself uh, viable as a whole? Mm -hmm. And by providing the support to agriculture that matters really, what is it that matters for agricultural growth? 
Well, let's begin with uh, infrastructure. Uh, let's begin with uh, basic infrastructure like irrigation and farm to market roads and uh, science that enables the farmer to be more productive and technology that enables him to take advantage of mechanization and also uh, education that enables the farmer and his children to appreciate agriculture and go into it as a, as a lifelong career. Okay, let's talk about a few of those details yes. after we take a short break. Yes. That was one thing that concerns me about the uh, about the the new law. Mm -hmm. um, as we were talking about before the break, you had mentioned that you know support in a couple of key areas for for the agriculture sector um, is really key. Uh, which is uh, to put it in, to put it another way, um, rather than forcing banks to loan to the sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, you believe that perhaps the government should focus more on making the sector an attractive market for lending. Yes. Uh, is that a yes. good way to put it? That's it. Yes. Okay. Uh, what, are, what are some of the, what are some of the, since things in this country seem to be more attractive if they happen quickly, uh, what are some of the, the, the you know, low-hanging fruit kind of steps that uh, the government can take that they're not taking now to, to boost agriculture? Uh, I would say seeds and germplasm. Mm -hmm. uh, most farmers uh, need to replace the seed stock that they use now. And the government, being the producer of the seed, the original seed, needs to push production of the good seeds as fast as they, they can. Mm -hmm. And once the farmers are able to put these seeds in the ground or use new, new germplasm for livestock and even for fisheries, then productivity should respond much faster than it has ever been in the past, let's say, 40 or 50 years. Uh, in addition to germplasm, there should be a much improved irrigation service system we have been putting a lot of money in irrigation, but we don't see much return in terms of increased irrigated area or irrigation efficiency. Well, that was a, the, uh, early on in President Duterte's term uh, under former Agriculture Secretary Pino, uh, uh, the irrigation initiative was was big was a big topic for a while mm. um, you know they were discussing providing free irrigation mm. for everyone and there was uh, going to be some a lot of development in in actual systems and that seems to have uh, that seems to have lost momentum is that a fair characterization or has it lost momentum the the third government has made irrigation free Mm -hmm. and the uh, farmers are happy with that. But we have been unable to increase irrigation coverage across many more jurisdictions. Uh, we continue to have a relatively large irrigation budget, uh, but I'm not quite sure whether or not that's actually resulting in greater water flow to many more farmers and many more areas. Mm -hmm. So that's an area that we should really look into carefully. Uh, it's an area of reform that cries out for attention after we have, after the government and the president has led this effort, say, to, to push tarification, which has uh, gone forward and I think it's a good step forward. Mm -hmm. um, another area that I've always been interested in, too, we hear often, quite often, the, uh, the figure that the average age of the Philippine farmer is something like 57 years old, mm -hmm. uh, and you're running out of people. Um, you know, mm -hmm. when it when it comes to that, uh, what what can the, what can the government do to kind of improve the the attractiveness of that as a mm -hmm. you know as a as a vocation as a business for for people? 
Secretary Dar has uh, embarked on several initiatives to attract young people into agriculture. But at the end of the day, what will really attract younger people into agriculture is to make agriculture a viable enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, to earn more and earn at a level that is uh, competitive with other jobs, to, uh, to, to be able to enjoy not only that level of income, but also the, li the rural lifestyle that uh, will attract, that will keep people on the farm. Um, when when uh, a part of that issue is that the land sizes are too small these days to enable a farmer to earn his main income from the crop. Right. He's got to be able to have another source of income off the farm. In central Luzon these days, the average age of the farmer is indeed in the higher ranges, close to 59, 58. But all of his children are in the city working or they're abroad as uh, overseas mm -hmm. workers and he's the only one left on the farm. But his welfare has increased because his children also remit to him money that is an addition to his income from the farm. So in central Luzon these days, which is the most uh, active farm area of the country, the original farm owner is often an absentee landlord. He's got a tenant working the farm. He's earning income not only from the farm itself through a sharing arrangement, but he's also getting additional income from his children who send him money. He is very well off, but the tenant on the farm is not that well off. Well, yeah, I, I mean, that's great for the farmer, but, but where does that leave the whole country? Mm -hmm. I mean, because that farm is not... Uh, that farm is not producing, you know, to its, you know, to its full potential. And, yes, I mean that's obviously that's obviously the problem. Yes. Um, or we wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have things like the rice import liberalization mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. you know, straighten out our our supply and everything. Um, and that's that's uh, that's been a. I, I think you've made the comment yourself in in a in a few interviews that, you know. Um, our productivity in this country is so low mm -hmm. and you know the cost of producing producing rice for instance yes. is so high per yes. kilo or per hectare and I saw it myself I just returned from a vacation out in the hinterlands mm -hmm. and the amount of when you when you observed local people with their small farms the amount of manual labor that goes into um, producing, say, one sack of palai uh, is just incredible to me. Yes. Um, yes. You know, and I realize I'm spoiled coming from the, the country that is the biggest agricultural producer in the world and mm -hmm. highly mechanized, but yeah. still, yeah. Um, yeah. in all of this time, you would think that, you know, if the farmers themselves haven't, you know, haven't come up with it, or maybe they do know the better way to do things. Mm -hmm. And the government's just not supporting them, or you know, is there a gap on both sides? It's it's a problem that cuts across the entire economy. Uh, we have a situation where the current figure is twenty four percent of our labor force is in agriculture. Okay, right. Uh, but only eight percent of our GDP is produced by agriculture. So even that alone, eight percent of GDP divided by twenty four percent of the total labor force gives you a very low productivity agricultural sector. Uh, in many cases in our agricultural sector, labor is so cheap that that's the first source of, uh, of, of, of input that people use. Mm -hmm. It's so cheap. So there's no real push to mechanize. In order for mechanization to take place, uh, labor has to move off the land and move somewhere. Where would that labor go? We have a fairly uh, quiescent word to use, uh, manufacturing sector. Yes. That's supposed to be the area that will absorb all the labor that's coming off the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the U.S. Well, only one and a half percent of the labor force in the U.S. is in agriculture. That's right. It's almost fully mechanized. And that's even the case at this time when 
uh, labor force in the U.S. is almost fully employed at three or four percent. Yeah, in the Philippines, so. um, unemployment right now is between five and six percent, but there's a lot of underemployment too on top of that. Mm -hmm. So we really need to push development across the economy, manufacturing to absorb labor, and while that takes place, mechanization in the agricultural sector to increase individual farm productivity. I see. So it's a fairly complex well, why don't they? Yeah. Why don't they? Uh, why don't they start uh, building some tractor factories? Yes, I yes, mean, that yes. would be the perfect solution, wouldn't it? Well, uh, uh, the RSF, the uh, Rice Competitiveness Enhancement Fund, does have a mechanization component. Mm -hmm. uh, Ten billion pesos every year, five billion pesos of which is uh, uh, dedicated to mechanization. Okay, let's uh, talk about that after we take a take a short break. Yes. Mga isyong pinag-uusapan, mga palitang laman ng pahayagan, impormasyong dapat niyong malaman, tatalakayin, pupusisiin, at hihimayin ni Mario Garcia kasama ang kanyang mga panauhin sa harap ng bayan. Face off! And we're back. Okay, you just mentioned the RCEF, which is a uh, actually a product of the rice terrification law. Yes, um, and that has been one of the big the big controversies of the year. Um, although it solved the problem of of uh, a little bit of a tightness in rice supply, mm -hmm. uh, the big complaint is is that it has severely dented farmers' already meager income by mm -hmm. lowering the price for domestic rice. Yes. Um, first of all, I think that probably confuses some people who have a small grasp of economics. Um, is it why should rice that is grown here be more expensive than rice that is grown, say, in Thailand or Vietnam and has to be sent over, mm. you know, has additional costs in shipping and then has to also pay a tariff and yet it is still cheaper than the rice that is sold here. Yes. Um, yes. How does that work? Well, it's a long uh, running problem that we've tried to solve. Uh, right now, you one can buy a kilo of rice in Bangkok for 22 pesos equivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try to buy that rice in the Philippines now, it will probably cost you north of 40 pesos. The reason why they're able to sell rice in their domestic market at 22 pesos equivalent in Thai baht is because they're highly productive and they have a lot of land to use to uh, produce the rice and they've got a very well developed uh, infrastructure system, roads that can transport the rice at a relatively low cost. In the Philippines, we unfortunately, to my mind, chose to support agriculture through price controls and price support. So if you take a look at the agricultural uh, rice program budget of the Philippines, you'll find out that fully 45% of that budget has been spent in NFA for rice support. Mm. Uh, instead of support that, say, increases productivity or support that increases, decreases farm-to-market costs, that increases irrigation. We've chosen that price protection method, which we now have through the last 40 years, I've learned that it really doesn't work. So the rice tarification law solves that by removing the uh, monopoly role of the NFA and shifting us all to providing the support that really matters, which is in terms of pushing farmers' productivity. Well, that's a, from a long-term point of view, that's what you should do. Yes. I mean, that is the, that is a better solution. However, um, hasn't the government been stuck with having to take the price control um, approach because you know, in order for the long-term solution to happen, 
uh, the farmers are going to uh, just what happened, you know, over this past year with the, with the very low prices, the farmers are going to suffer for, a, some of them are going to suffer for a while until these more sustainable solutions start to work out down the line. So how, what, do you, what do you do? But um, that's been the quandary we've been in at several points in our history mm -hmm. since, uh, the mid, since the mid-80s. We could have liberalized in 1985, 1986. We didn't. We said that the farmers were not ready. We could have liberalized in the mid-90s, but then again, we also said the farmers are not ready. We could have liberalized in 2014, but we again said the farmers are not ready, and we kept seeking extensions for all these price support mechanisms. Right. Uh, but we didn't really pay attention to what really matters to make them ready because we were actually spending our money on price support. Now we've taken the bull by the horns and the president uh, bit the bullet and said, let's do this. Uh, so there is a transition process taking place right now. And the way to help the farmers through this transition is by what Secretary Dar has already started in the past few months, which is to give out uh, unconditional cash transfers, increase the amounts that are being given out through these unconditional cash transfers, that will enable farmers to make a choice. Will I, as a farmer, for example, uh, choose to remain in rice and push through the productivity improvement that's necessary? Or will I move out of rice, uh, take this uh, handout and use it as my capital to get into other commodities, mm -hmm. other uh, lines of business, other occupations that will enable me to make a choice. And I think that's actually what's happening now. And uh, there will be some pain, especially on the farmer side, but the RSF and the cash handouts are making things a little bit better for them. I see. And then we come, and that brings us right back around to House Bill 5681. Yes. Um, in, in that in that context, then that improving credit to to the farmers also helps to fill in that gap, you know, during the transition, so yes. that those who are, um, you know, might be feeling a pinch from this can, you know, can do something. Is that also its intent? And 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 specifically, will the will the bill encourage banks to still lend to farmers who are struggling with low prices for their produce because mm -hmm. of the, I mean, are the banks on board with the long-term vision? Are, yes. are you, will this force them to, to do that? I believe so, uh, because the, uh, the new bill, uh, Congressman Kua, imaginatively provides for various avenues to support agricultural loans. Such as? So it's not only for loans to agricultural projects, it's also loans to small and medium enterprises in the rural areas. Which will still count against the bank's Yes, yes percentage. compliance with the mm -hmm. law. It also provides for equity infusion by banks into enterprises and businesses that support farm enterprises, like uh, a big bank lending, putting equity into a smaller bank that is located in the rural areas. It, it in fact, also provides for a grant mechanism and that grant mechanism is intended to support farm, farm de farmer development, particularly skill development in farm enterprises and managing cooperatives. That's what Congressman Kua believes in, that a, a major push to a more collectivized activity in the rural areas mm -hmm. among the poor will help them marshal their resources and tackle their problems together. I see. Now, now this this uh, this last part you're talking about more more uh, collectivization, more cooperatives, um, and in in uh, to maybe an extreme sense, actually putting land together. Mm -hmm. um, this all works against the grain of the agrarian reform program, which has been to cut everything up. Um, you know, everybody gets their own little mm. gets their own little plot of land. Um, 
Is the agrarian reform program obsolete now? I mean, should that be should that be taken? You know, should they take another look at how they're doing that? Um, I, it's 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 interesting. I, I'll, I have another reason for asking that is because uh, I know a lot of sugar farmers, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of the sugar farmers, individual farmers, are actually kind of against too much agrarian reform because it makes them unproductive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so so is you know, is fifty six eighty one going to kind of start pulling back on agrarian reform? And how do they? And how how does the bill make sure that the credit doesn't go to the very big mm -hmm. enterprises? You know that are going to you know going to cut the cut the feet on, out of the independence of the small farmers uh, because you know what the political reaction to that sort of thing yes. would be. Yes, yes. Well, 5681 uh, encourages farmers to farm together. Mm -hmm. uh, we know, for example, from the experience of Central Luzon, again, I keep coming back to Central Luzon because we see examples arising that uh, enable farmers to work around the regulations that, that hamper their operations. There are a lot of farmers who now operate much larger, much larger pieces of land that are owned by many farmers but are operated as one. That enables them to, uh, to use some mechanization. I see. And this has happened uh, 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 under the radar. And it has happened despite the existence of the agrarian reform law. I see. Because it is the it is a farmer's reaction to to the realities that now face them in the modern era. And so, uh, by uh, by encouraging the farmers to work together this way, uh, this fifty six eighty one just just recognizes what is now reality. That's very good. Let's take another short break. Yeah. Hi everyone, I am Zihir Basho and welcome to the new Clark City where the 30th Southeast Asian Games will be held this November. Dito gaganapin ang tagisa ng mga atleta mula sa iba't ibang bansa ng Southeast Asian region. One aspect that uh, hasn't been mentioned yet, and it sh is probably very, very much at the top of people's minds today since uh, the central portion of the country has again been struck by another typhoon, this time Typhoon Ursula. And we, of course we hope that everyone affected is safe and recovering. Uh, however, that is going to make a pretty serious dent in agriculture. I believe the last one, tea soy, uh, something like two billion dollars in, or dollars, I'm sorry, I'm uh, remembering where I'm from, two billion pesos in uh, agricultural damage from Typhoon tea soy just a couple of weeks ago and now we've had another one, fortunately not quite as strong, but from what I saw was, did some damage. Um, yeah. In, in lending uh, under under 5681 or any other program, a bank is considering its risk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not only you know the farmer himself and what his financial management is, but what kind of crop he's growing and what his prospects are for, for earning you know the expected revenue from that crop. Mm -hmm. 
a particular farmer could be the best credit risk in the world as far as the bank's concerned. Great record, um, yeah. you know, growing a, growing a crop that's in demand, yeah. um, fairly productive, yeah. uh, a, good, a good credit risk. The bank lends him and then here comes the typhoon, the crop is gone. Yeah. Um, you know, so the, the, the answer to that is crop insurance, of course, for the farmer. But, I mean, is it, how does the crop insurance extend to the credit as well? And is 5681 going to, you know, address, you know, calamity um, contingencies at all? Because I know that is a big thing for, that is a big thing for, for banks lending and agriculture in particular. That's, that's yeah. probably yes. one of the biggest risks that yes. they're calculating. Yeah. To some extent, yes, but we do have a law uh, here where whenever a bank lends to either rice or corn, by law, that loan must be covered by crop insurance. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's mandatory. So if, if it's rice or corn, at least, then it's mandatory. For other crops, uh, unfortunately, the uh, law doesn't mandate it. And uh, the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation is, however, in the process of building up the, um, uh, the database, uh, what do you call this, the, the insurance information necessary to enable them to cover other crops, like sugar, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, there is an intention to increase and expand the coverage of the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation to be able to do this. And to, do they have sufficient resources to do that? I mean, are they, are they getting proper budgetary support uh, for that? In uh, fact, the proposal is coming from the Department of Finance to make the insurance business much more uh, broad, much, much broader mm -hmm. by uh, having PCIC act more like a reinsurer rather than the first insurer so that the private sector insurance companies will also consider crop insurance as part of their line of business. So that increases the insurance side of things. Um, the other aspect is that the Department of Agriculture has mechanisms to support uh, farmers uh, who are hit by calamities. They call this the Sure Aid Program, mm -hmm. where essentially it's a very low cost or no interest loan handed out to the farmer who has been certified to be hit by a calamity of any commodity, not, not only in rice, but right. any commodity. So there are, uh, there's also the National Food Authority, which retains its uh, role as a buffer stock mechanism, and the buffer stock of rice is kept as an emergency measure, uh, principally for calamity. So we do have in this country a lot of experience now dealing with calamities and so there is some help that's going to be extended to farmers who are hit by calamities. I see. Not as much as we would all well, like. Well of course I mean yeah. you know there's probably yeah. there's probably never, never. as much yeah. as, as yeah. everybody would yeah. like but um, but you know. an interesting part of the discussion of course is that in the US and Europe the the evolution of the agricultural support systems have come to a modern age where most of the support is being given in the form of insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, not in the form of handouts, not in the form of subsidies, but really insurance. Well, that's in, in but in the U.S., I mean, mm -hmm. our insurance industry is several orders of magnitude yeah. more developed than it is here. Yes, so yes. maybe that's something that, yes. you know, we may be a decade or, or longer away from seeing here. Yeah. Um, what about... Uh, one one thing that and, and to me it seems like um, the 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 intent behind behind uh, the the idea has dimmed a little bit, but uh, the rice self sufficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that's do you think that's important, um, mm -hmm. or or should people stop pushing that and start? looking at it a different way. I mean, obviously the country should be able to feed itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that necessarily mean rice self-sufficiency? Um, no. Uh, it means that we need to pay attention to the elements that enable us to be much more productive so that we can achieve 
achieve the goal of being able to feed ourselves at competitive rates in comparison to our neighbors across Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal should be, I believe, stated in such a way that we are able to attain the productivity rates, the cost of production, the benchmarks that, say, Vietnam and Thailand have in rice. Uh, Vietnam is about uh, five pesos per kilo. Uh, Thailand is about six pesos per kilo. On the average, we are at 12 pesos per kilo. Right, that's about 12. Uh, we need to uh, push our production costs uh, lower so that uh, we're at least competitive with them with the 35% tariff. And 35% tariff in most cases is already a good protection for farmers. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is that is a pretty stiff tariff. So, yeah. you know, our production costs are double yeah. what those are. On the are. average. Yeah, but the 35% would cut that down somewhat. But yes. That is still a pretty tall order yes. to cut your production costs almost in half. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the first yeah. step really is to increase productivity right now. We're at barely four, four tons per hectare for rice. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at all the other commodities, we're about that range, just below uh, the average uh, in comparison with other ASEAN countries. So the idea is to uh, push productivity to be at least closer to what the ASEAN uh, levels are. And in so doing, be able to achieve also the cost of production levels that they have. I see. Okay. Any final thoughts? Uh, anything that you would like to like to tell people in the government working on this, or tell the public to help them understand mm -hmm. what's going on a little yeah. better? Our principal problem is how do we push productivity, and we need to be able to provide assistance to farmers in ways that really matter for productivity. Uh, the first major area of uh, helping farmers is to provide them with good seed. And I believe that the Philippine Rice Research Institute and the government is able to do that and should do that. We should also do that, not only for rice, but for all the other commodities, for livestock, for corn, for coconut, for fruits, for other high value commodities that enable the farmer to diversify not only uh, in rice and corn, but also other commodities. Uh, that makes for a much richer, much wealthier uh, rural area that makes for a much more diversified agriculture that should attract young people because they are able to earn more from their farms rather than from just concentrating on low productivity rice. I see. Okay, thank you. Well, from my point of view, the proposed amendments to the 2009 Agri-Agra law are a great idea and a good start. And it seems that policymakers, both in Congress and in the concerned agencies like the Department of Agriculture and Department of Finance, know what needs to be done and are on the right track. The, the biggest problem, it seems to me, is getting the public, which looks for things to happen very quickly, to understand that you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet and you know agriculture is not going to be fixed overnight nor are food prices going to be as low as everybody wants them to be all the time um, and things are not going to go completely smoothly in just a year or two. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest challenge for policymakers, and I think Mr. Tolentino for coming in and helping to explain some of this because, you know, things take time. Uh, it, they're on the right track, but it's going to take years to fix what has been several decades of going about it the wrong way. Um, fortunately, we have some we have some policymakers now that seem to be doing their best and may make some progress. Uh, the biggest challenge is seeing this continued past the next couple of years because when administrations change, opinions and intentions seem to change as well and we may find ourselves right back where we started in a couple of years time. We hope that's not the case but you know time will tell. 
like to thank my guest today, former Agriculture Undersecretary and Monetary Board stalwart, Bruce Tolentino, and thank you for coming in. I know you're headed out with your family on vacation. Hope you enjoy your trip. Yeah. I'm Ben Kritz, and this has been Eye on Business. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>